Okay, so would you please turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. That's where we're going to look at today. In the last century, in fact, uh, throughout the centuries, there's been battles and church groups, denominations, about how should you understand the Bible? Should you believe it is fully inspired? Or should you think, well, maybe the spirit, you know, whenever it talks about spiritual things, it's correct, but maybe it's not correct about other things. And, all right, if you're going to take that view, then how do you decide which part's true and which part's not true? And some, in the last century, there was a, uh, a theologian named Rudolf Bultmann, and he was very influential as a theologian, but he did not believe in the resurrection of Christ. And there were others like that. And then uh, one of the students of uh, some of these liberal professors, he changed his mind. He, he, didn't, he couldn't go along with what they were saying. And his name was Karl Barth. Barth? Barth? <laughs> I'm not sure which it is. And, uh, and so he, he put his faith in Christ, believed in the resurrection. He didn't fully believe all the Bible, I don't think, but, but uh, and he started what was called neo-orthodoxy. Now, why am I saying, mentioning all this? Well, one time on a trip to the United States, someone asked him, he'd written a million, a lot of books, and someone said, would you summarize the essence of the millions of words you published? And this is what he said. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was right about that. It's interesting, in the book of the Gospel of John, the word love is used 37 times. In chapters 1 through 12, it's used seven times. From chapter 13 to the end of the Gospel of John, it's used 30 times. Why do I mention this? Because there is an emphasis on the love of God. God loves us more than we know. At times we may not realize it, we may not feel like it, but he does. He loves us more than we know. Now there's some scholarly disagreement about when the foot washing took place. I think it was on the night of the Lord's Supper. I think it was probably before the Lord's, Lord's Supper. I think Judas was probably present. I think he left later, but I'm not real, you know, some of these questions we're not always certain about. But it's interesting about the time of the Lord's Supper, the disciples were having an argument. Did you know this? They were arguing about who was the greatest among them. Who was the greatest among them? Well, Luke 22, <coughs> verse 24 says, And there arose also a dispute among them as to which of them was regarded to be the greatest. No, that's the way it is in the world outside of the, us. And maybe sometimes in the church. We want to decide who is the greatest. We want, you know, to be first. That's the, the old nature that we have. So, let's uh, pick up at John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God, was going back to God, got up from supper, and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, 
nor do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I've chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now, there's much in these verses. Uh, we could spend a lot of time here, but... <laughs> I don't plan to cover it all. But notice he does tell the disciples, one of you is going to betray me. And I'm telling you in advance, so you'll know when it happens, that I knew. And you'll be, in essence, even more convinced of who I am. Okay, first notice in these verses, God's love is forever. John 13, verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. God's love is forever. Now notice also it says here, knowing, uh, knowing that his hour had come, there is an emphasis in the Gospel of John about the hour that was coming for Jesus. Let me mention several verses about this. Uh, chapter 2, verse 4, John. These are all from the Gospel of John. Chapter 2, verse 4, mine hour is not yet come. Chapter 7, verse 30, his hour was not yet come. Chapter 8, verse 20, his hour was not yet come. Chapter 12, verse 23, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Chapter 13, verse 1, that's where we are now. Jesus knew that his hour was come. 17, 1, Father, the hour is come. What was this divinely appointed hour? It was the time that he would be on the cross to die for our sins he would be in the grave for three days and then he would rise again that was the hour the divinely appointed hour until it was the right time they could not arrest Jesus they could not put him to death until the hour came and Jesus says it says it for me John says, Jesus loved his disciples to the end. To the end. By the way, you and I are included in that. He loves us to the end. To the end of our lives, he loves us. But it could mean more than that. It could mean he loves us eternally more than we know. And in fact, uh, some think that the Apostle John kind of said it that way so that you kind of have to think about what it means. 
do you really understand that? I'm still, I'm still learning myself. Jesus loves me more than I know. And he loves you more than you know. He loves you more than you can imagine. He went to the cross and took your sins and my sins upon himself on the cross. And uh, God's love is forever. He loved them to the end. He will love us forever. And second, God's love is for all. I believe Judas was still present for the foot washing. Look again at John 13, verse 16. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I've chosen. But it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Now notice, first though, he says, a slave is not greater than his master. What I'm thinking is, Jesus is saying here, is if I'm going to wash your feet, if I'm going to be willing to do what needs to be done to help you, you need to be willing to do what needs to be done to help others. Keep in mind, these disciples were just arguing about it, which of them is the greatest. It's almost like, I don't want to wash your feet. I mean, after all, I'm more important than you. You, you should be washing my feet. That's almost the attitude they have. And then Jesus says, um, speaks about he who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. He's quoting a scripture here. I believe Judas was present for the foot washing. And I believe the foot washing was a preview of the meaning of the cross. Just as Jesus was willing to humble himself and wash his feet, so he would be willing to humble himself and go to the cross to die for their sins. And again, the disciples were arguing. You know, they were thinking, which, which one of us is the greatest? And they wanted to think each one, you know, they were tempted to think they were the greatest. Now, why was it necessary to wash feet, by the way? Um, sometimes when people come to our house, they may say, would you like me to take off my shoes and leave them at the door? <laughs> that doesn't happen a lot. But in that day and time, people would often walk down the streets with uh, these types of uh, sandals on. And uh, the streets were muddy oftentimes, and sometimes they would put some sewage in the street, and you don't know what you've got on your feet. And some houses would have like a little pool of water, so that when you got, before you left the house, you could kind of wash yourself off a little bit, or once you got back, you could wash your feet off. But if you didn't have something like that, uh, maybe uh, you'd have a servant, or the, the lowest servant of the house, would be the one to have to do the foot washing, and that was not a pleasant task. It was, it was not the job people wanted to do. They didn't want to do the foot washing. But Jesus was willing to do the, uh, the most menial task to show that he was their servant as well as their Lord. God's love is for all, even for Judas. Judas was there. Our Lord washed his feet. That's what I believe. I believe God loves everyone in this world. The scripture says he's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to salvation, all to be forgiven. If he loves people, this world, we need to love people in this world. That means want what is best for them. And what is best for them is they come to a saving knowledge of Christ. God's love is for all. It knows no bounds. Pilate could not take Jesus' life unless authority had been given to him to do so. Jesus could have called down 10,000 angels to save him from the cross. But he didn't. What I'm saying is here, 
Jesus sacrificed his life for us. He sacrificed his life. He gave his life as a sacrifice. He did not have to do it. He did it out of love for us. And Jesus' love was for all. Uh, the love of Jesus transcends every type of class or prejudice imaginable. He took the place of the lowest servant right before he would be going to the cross. He took the place of the lowest servant with his disciples. He would love those of this world regardless of who they were, regardless of where they were. And he wants us to have that type of love for others. Our love may stop at a racial barrier or something, and I hope not. Some other type of barrier, <coughs> I hope not. The love of Jesus was an act of love. Uh, it, it's almost, uh, you get the picture here, the disciples are sitting around kind of waiting on someone else to wash the feet. They don't want to do it. They're waiting for someone else. And Jesus does it. The love of Jesus cleanses. Peter did not want his master to wash his feet. Did you know there's some people, they may feel like God is convicting them of something in their life, uh, but they don't want to walk the aisle. They may not want to do what God wants them to do. Don't be too proud to accept the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. We all need it. We all need it. And Jesus uh, was telling Peter, if you're not going to let me wash your feet, you're, you're not going to have anything to do with it. And then Jesus says, well, you know, or pardon me, Peter says, well, wash my head. And you're like, uh, yeah, I, I. So then he was willing for, to have Jesus wash his feet. Now, what is it that you and I may not be willing to let Jesus do in our life? You've got to be willing to do whatever he wants with your life. You've got to be willing to fully surrender to him. Now, the cleansing that Jesus gives from the cross is forever. Let me read to you from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, listen to this, made us alive together with Christ, every one of us who are believers, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? If you're a believer in Jesus, you are right now seated in Jesus in the heavenly places. We are seated with him in the heavenly places. Our spirit is here in this earth, but we are also with God in the heavenly places. That's our position in Christ that will never change. That's our position in Christ. Now, in this world, our condition can change daily. There'll be times temptation will come and we'll we may yield to it, and then we're, you know, we've done something sinful. We need God's forgiveness. Our position never changes. We are in God's presence. Our spirit, that's what it says. We were seated with Christ in the heavenlies. But our condition can change where we need forgiveness here on this earth. There are consequences to sin. And we need to seek to keep our heart pure. All right, now, uh, by the way, some people seem to think, and maybe preachers have uh, kind of given this idea, 
Trust Jesus and all your problems will end. It'll be so wonderful. Just trust Jesus. Well, sometimes, uh, you know, when you trust Jesus, some problems can begin. And, uh, and it's, uh, uh, here's part of the reason why. When we're living our lives without fully surrendering to the Lord, without even giving our life to the Lord, we do what we think is best. That's what we grow up, we, we, we do, you know, have it your way, one of the Psalms says, in the secular world. Uh, I did it my way. It's my way or the highway is the attitude of some people. No, that's what we were before we fully trusted Christ as our Savior. Now we need to do it God's way. But we're used to doing things our way, trusting ourselves. Now we need to stop doing that and start trusting God. And that that takes that takes some time. It's, it's in fact, you could say it's something that we're going to be working on most of the rest of our life, if not all of it. And uh, by the way, it, it, it may be difficult to resist temptation. Uh, I love you, even if you fall to temptation. And I hope you love me if I do. <laughs> but my point is, don't give up. Don't give up. Keep resisting. Keep seeking to resist that temptation. The Lord can help you to do it. When we think only of ourselves, we're serving ourselves. And when we do that, we're missing out on the blessings God has for us. There is a blessing in serving the Lord and serving others. So in contrast to the selfishness of the disciples, they were arguing about who was the greatest. Jesus denied himself and put his disciples first. And that's what he wants us to do. Not put ourselves first, put him first. Put Jesus first in our lives and then put others before ourselves. So God's love is forever, God's love is for all, and God's love is to be followed. Look at verses 14 and 15. Uh, if I, or maybe this is just 14. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, will wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Do you know that some Christians in the past have thought that this was a third ordinance? You've got baptism, you've got communion, and foot washing. And every so often, some of these churches would have a time where they would wash one another's feet. Because Jesus says, wash one another's feet. Now, I personally don't think this is an ordinance. I've, I've done quite a bit of study on it. I don't think it's an ordinance. Uh, nowhere else in scripture are we commanded to wash someone else's feet. That was a practice at the time, uh, you know, because people had dirty feet and they might come to your house and you'd get the lowest servant to wash the feet. Uh, but today, <laughs> when you come to someone's house, normally you have shoes on, you can wipe your feet off before you come in. You don't have to wash them. Uh, if, if someone else, uh, if you require people to wash their feet before you come into their house, let me know if in the service I'd be interested to hear that. No. I think the point is here, Jesus is setting an example for us. We need to be willing as believers to do whatever he wants us to do to, for, for others, to help them what he wants us to do. Even if it's the lowest task, he wants us to be willing to do it for others. He says we are to follow his example. He says, I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. So what's the most menial task we can do to help someone? That's what the Lord wants us to be willing to do. I'm not saying it's easy. You know, the, uh, the scripture says that the husband's to be the head of the house. But do you know, the husbands, uh, that means you're to be a servant. As Jesus was our master, and yet he served us. Wives, 
I think oftentimes wives will do menial tasks, and I'm so thankful. And we ought to be grateful and not take it for granted uh, if we're husband. In other words, we need to be willing to do for others what our Lord has done for us, the most menial task. And if we have this type of approach in our home, where we're seeking to serve our family, not just tell them what to do, but serve them, our children will likely have that type of attitude in life. We tend, in our culture, to look down on those who are inferior for some reason, they don't have much authority, and the people who are most admired and the ones who are wealthiest or have all kinds of people that they're controlling. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? I believe our Lord's indicating here is the greatest servant, the greatest servant. Do you want others to serve you? Or are you willing to serve them? I also think the cleansing of the feet represented the cleansing of the sins by the blood of Christ. And I'm so thankful that he provides for our cleansing by his love, by going to the cross of Calvary and rising from the dead. I want to finish with something my student, one of my students wrote in an online post about some of these verses. He said, just today I heard what I think is the best message on servant leadership I've ever heard. He had in parentheses, it wasn't what I preached. He said the message was based off of John 13 and the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. But as he got to verse 3, I noticed something. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking the towel, he girded himself. It says that Jesus washed the disciples' feet, knowing three things, what the Father had given him, where he was from, and where he was going. He was completely secure in his identity. A few years back, the Lord told me something very clearly. He told me, you can't leave if you're insecure. And the next morning, he spoke to me again and said, insecurity is sin. Because insecurity means that you're trying to find your security in something other than me. These words changed my life forever. I became aware of the idolatry of insecurity. You cannot lead or serve if you are insecure because you will constantly be trying to prove yourself and protect yourself. That will cause you to compare yourself to others and become critical of others. Pardon <coughs> me. Only someone who is truly secure in their identity in the Lord can lead in such a great way as to lay their garments aside and wash the feet of those they lead. Would you bow with me in prayer? <coughs> Lord, I thank you again for your love for us. It is more wonderful than we can imagine or know. And the, uh, the, the, the devil, Satan, loves to tell us God doesn't love us. Just look at the world. Or he'll use whatever, whatever excuse he can to say God doesn't love us. But you proved your love by going to the cross at Calvary, by rising from the Help us not to doubt your love for us. Help us to be more deeply love you and seek to follow you and serve you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing a... Uh...